Thank you everybody for joining us for another All Things Data on the OpenShift Commons briefing channel. This is a new briefing series and we're excited for everybody to join us. And if you have any um, ideas or things that you would like to see in the future, please let me know. Today we have Jakob Schultz uh, from Red Hat as well as Karan Singh from Red Hat. And thank you both for joining us. They're here to talk about AMQ um, using OpenShift Container Storage. So Jakob, please take it away. Okay, let me share my screen. So uh, in this presentation, it will be me uh, presenting together with Karan. So I am principal software engineer in the Red Hat middleware engineering team. And uh, Karan is a senior architect in the Red Hat storage uh, unit. And uh, today we will give you some introduction to AMQ streams and uh, to the storage requirements which AMQ streams uh, has. And then uh, we will talk a bit more about the importance of OpenShift container storage for AMQ streams, how does it fit together, and what are the advantages uh, which uh, you can, uh, you can uh, get from uh, using these two together. So uh, let me first do a quick introduction into what AMQ Streams is. And uh, it's a Red Hat's distribution of uh, Apache Kafka. It has two versions. One of them is for Red Hat Enterprise Linux. So that's uh, suitable if you want to run uh, Apache Kafka on uh, VMs or bare metal directly without any containers and uh, OpenShift or Kubernetes orchestration. And the second version is for OCP, for uh, OpenShift Container Platform, which obviously for this talk is the relevant one. And in OCP, we are using the power of operators from the Streamsy project. Streamsy is a CNCF project which uh, uh, makes sure that Kafka runs uh, natively on Kubernetes and OpenShift environments. And uh, with the operators, AMQ streams can run basically anywhere where uh, OCP is running. So it can be on VMs, on bare metal, on private clouds or public clouds, wherever OpenShift is supported. Uh, you can run AMQ streams as well. And uh, uh, with AMQ streams on OCP, we support OCP 3.11 and higher. So uh, if you haven't jumped uh, on the OpenShift 4 train yet, uh, we have you covered as well. But uh, OpenShift 4 is, of course, great with a lot of improvements. So uh, ideally, you should run it there. And uh, for those who don't know what Apache Kafka is, let's uh, give a quick introduction of how it is, what makes it special, and how it works. And there are actually many different definitions of Apache Kafka. One of them is streaming data platform. What does that mean is that uh, Apache Kafka basically provides capabilities for uh, storing, delivering, and processing data, which makes it uh, kind of ideal platform for doing streaming data, even driven architecture, stream processing, and so on. But it is also a published subscribe messaging system, so uh, it can be used as, a, as an alternative to, let's say, the traditional uh, JMS style messaging system and can be used for the traditional uh, integration use cases. And uh, then the third definition I have here is a distributed horizontally scalable fault tolerant uh, commit lock. I love this one because uh, it's full of very nice uh, buzzwords and it sounds very sophisticated. But uh, don't get misled by that. It's not really just a random collection of some fancy words. It's actually a pretty accurate definition of how uh, Kafka works, because if you look at the Kafka broker in uh, detail, how it is implemented, it really is distributed horizontally scalable fault around commit lock. So uh, it's pretty accurate. Kafka was originally created uh, at LinkedIn. But later it was open sourced and now it's, uh, as the name suggests, part of the Apache Software Foundation. And it was from the beginning designed to be fast, scalable, durable and available. And it uh, achieves that by being distributed by nature. So uh, it 
does basically everything it does is based around data partitioning or sharding if you want. So all the data are split into some smaller shards which are handled individually. And that's how basically Kafka is able to achieve the high throughput uh, with uh, fairly low latency uh, for delivering the data. And uh, that's what gives it the ability to handle a huge number of uh, consumers. What I think is always important to mention is that uh, while in this talk, we will mostly focus on the Kafka broker, which is where the storage comes uh, into play. Uh, Kafka itself is uh, ecosystem rather than a single project or a single component. So apart from the broker, uh, it has its own uh, stream processing uh, library in Java. It has its own clients for different languages. It has its own integration framework called Kafka Connect. And even beyond the Apache Kafka project itself, there are integration with many different third-party tools, uh, all the big data tooling, stream processing frameworks such as uh, Spark, Storm, and so on. All of them have great support for Kafka. So I always like to point out that it's not just the messaging broker itself, but it's really an ecosystem of uh, many different components. So I already said that uh, Kafka was designed to be distributed and it does so by uh, partitioning the data. So when sending and or receiving messages, we always uh, send to or receive from a topic. But every topic is always split into one or more partitions. Uh, so it can be that topic is just a single partition, but in most cases it's uh, many partitions for each topic. And these partitions act as a shard. So most of the actual work is always done uh, on the partition level and the topic is really more a virtual object where you send or receive the messages from, but which gets kind of internally pointed to the right partition. And uh, each message is always written only to single partition for a given topic. And uh, Kafka is following this idea of uh, smart clients and dumb brokers. So uh, the broker is really just the commit lock, as I mentioned uh, before. And it's the clients which have a lot of the logic uh, of distributing the messages into the partitions. So when you try to send some message, then uh, the client decides into which partition it should be sent based on the message key or uh, based on... Uh, uh, some round robin distribution if there is no message key and then uh, the consumers will similarly decide which consumer should consume from which partition and so on. So that's what allows it to scale so nicely because there's no uh, single point through which all the messages need to flow in the brokers uh, or anything like that. So where the partitions were doing the scaling and the sharding of the data Replication is a concept which provides uh, uh, availability and durability guarantees. And uh, basically every partition can consist out of one or more replicas. And the replicas have always uh, two roles. One of the replicas will be a leader. That's kind of the main replica which is used by the producers to send the messages to. And then the other replicas will be called followers and they will act as a backup to kind of provide the redundancy for the data. And the followers will really just connect to the leader and will uh, copy all the messages which the leader receives. And uh, they will try to stay as much in sync as possible so that when the leader is lost, uh, that uh, they can take over the role and uh, serve the messages without any data loss. And uh, of course, that means that the roles can be changed uh, during the Kafka cluster lifecycle. So in this uh, picture, you can see that we have three brokers with a single topic, which has three partitions with uh, three replicas each. And you can see the dark blue partitions or replicas, they are the leaders. And you can see how they are feeding the data to the followers so that the followers can keep the copy of the data. And now, of course, what can happen, for example, the broker C goes down because of some hardware failure or whatever. And uh, basically, immediately, the one of the follower replicas on the broker B was able to take over, becomes the new leader. 
and uh, the clients can just reconnect there and keep working uh, without any significant disruptions. Now the replication is really important for Kafka and cannot be fully replaced by mirroring on the storage level because uh, having multiple active uh, replicas available with the same data means that uh, the availability is really great and they can very quickly take over if the leader fails. But it's also important for the reliability that the data are written to multiple different disks on a multiple different uh, brokers when they get uh, put into the disk buffers and then later uh, written to the disks. So uh, the replication is not something what you can fully replace uh, with storage mirroring or to the storage mirroring can help with uh, other things. Now, uh, because we want to talk about how OpenShift container storage fits with AMQ streams, uh, let's look a bit more about what kind of storage AMQ stream supports and what are the requirements uh, for storage which we have. So on OpenShift, we currently support three types of storage. The first one is the ephemeral storage, which uh, is using the empty DIR volumes. So if you don't know what the empty DIR volume is on Kubernetes or OpenShift, it's uh, kind of a, you can imagine it as a temp DIR somewhere on the host. So uh, it works quite well for things like development or CI pipelines but it doesn't really provide any data reliability, so it's not supported for production. Then the second storage type which we support is persistent volume claim storage. So uh, what we do here is uh, we just use the storage classes and persistent volume claims as a Kubernetes-based mechanism to dynamically provision the storage. And that's really great because it means we do not need to kind of write a separate support for each kind of storage type uh, which Kubernetes or OpenShift support. But once the support exists in OpenShift or Kubernetes, we can automatically take it and use it. And then uh, the third type is something what's called JBot storage, just a bunch of disks, which really what it does is uh, it allows you to specify that the broker should use multiple volumes of one of the types, uh, one of the two types uh, I talked about before. And that's useful to increase the capacity and performance uh, of the brokers in some cases. Now, uh, Kafka was basically written to not require any sophisticated storage features or appliances. So it doesn't really need storage mirroring. Uh, it doesn't really need uh, RAID arrays to make bigger disks. It can use multiple separate disks instead. It doesn't need read write many disks. Uh, so you can easily use even local storage with it. And the actual requirement which we have for the storage is that it needs to be block storage because uh, file storage uh, things such as NFS uh, does not really work well with Kafka and is not supported. So uh, what is really the main requirement is to have block storage uh, and ideally with the XFS or X4 file systems. Now uh, the OCS block storage is of course one of the supported storage types. And while uh, it uh, might have some features which I said before are not required, uh, the fact that they are not uh, the minimum requirement for Kafka doesn't mean that they are not useful. And uh, in the second part of this presentation, Karan will uh, talk a bit more about where uh, OCS can add the value over some other storage types. And uh, when, uh, so I'm really from the engineering, not really from the field, but uh, I get involved in talking with our field uh, people and with some of the customers. And OpenShift container storage actually comes up quite regularly in the AMQ streams discussion. And uh, while in the next slides we will show some of the numbers and examples, uh, mainly from Amazon AWS, uh, because that's easy to reproduce for everyone. It uh, actually comes up quite often in discussions with the customers or users who want to run AMQ streams on premise because they often start up with some questions like does Kafka support NFS, can we use that? And uh, the answer is no, but quite often the users don't have anything else uh, on premise. 
and that's why how kind of the discussion quickly turns to OpenShift container storage uh, because that's an interesting alternative uh, for them. And uh, just remember that uh, with OCS you always need to use the block storage which aim with AMQ streams and not the file storage. And with this I will hand over to Karan who will uh, talk a bit more about the specific details. So Jakob, Jakob have, have gave you a pretty nice uh, introduction to Kafka and he also painted like what storage requirements Kafka imposes on you, right? So in the second half of the presentation, we're gonna um, transition to how OpenShift container storage adds value to your AMQ stream or Kafka deployments. So if you're running AMQ streams on top of OpenShift, then by introducing OCS for your persistence, persistency storage layer for, for Kafka, it, it uh, gives you performance, additional performance and, uh, and additional resiliency. We're gonna talk in detail about these two parameters. So as Jakub mentioned, Kafka is, is natively designed with fault tolerancy and, and you know, it's inherent, inherently dis uh, distributed and provides better, it's, it's pretty good in doing that, but OCS can add additional resiliency features and uh, could provide you additional improved uh, service availabilities during infrastructure failure scenarios like uh, like a node goes away or a storage uh, volume destroyed itself so so these are the benefits that you can get from by using OCS so let's quickly cover performance as the first thing so in our lab we have tested uh, various different combination of uh, storage backends so we have tested this on AWS. So standard OCS uh, OpenShift container deployment with three masters and uh, and three workers for for Kafka. We have tested uh, uh, different versions of OCS just to make sure whatever we are testing uh, is is consistent and uh, just just to have uh, various different data points. So we have tested uh, we have tested OCS 4.2, uh, the current release, and we have also tested the future release of OCS 4.4.3 which is coming you know in a few few months i would say we have also tested uh, different storage classes which amazon offers so ebs uh, gp2 and uh, provisioned iops storage classes so we have done a comparison just to see how different storage backend performs once you apply kafka load on top of it the architecture looks like this uh, we uh, everything is running inside openshift and uh, our storage is provisioned using openshift container storage each of the Kafka broker have their own independent block volumes because uh, Kafka works uh, nicely on block. And uh, the, com the supporting component, which is Zookeeper, has also got some tiny bit of, uh, of, of block storage so that they, it can store its metadata information. On the load side, we have tested, open, we have used Open Messaging Framework, which is again a CNCF project. We applied Kafka, so a Kafka producer app, uh, eight of them were writing to the uh, to the uh, topics of AMQ, and then on the other side, another eight consumer apps were reading the same topics from the uh, from the Kafka topic. So this is a pretty standard Kafka architecture. So let's let's look at the performance. There are a lot of information on this graph. So this is performance characterization across different storage options. So before we go into the numbers, let's uh, talk about. Uh, uh, the config real quick so three kafka broker pods and uh, with each uh, each pod having three uh, so three uh, storage storage nodes for openshift container storage because it storage has to run on a node so which is why we have to use uh, a physical or a virtual uh, instance on aws for ocs standard uh, small uh, message size and one pv for every broker pod in kafka on the on the y-axis, we have uh, tested uh, produced messages per second, the metric that we were looking. In the next slide, we have messages consumed per second. So uh, on the column side here, we have tested uh, uh, OCS on OCS consuming EBS for for its uh, for its storage needs, which is the current uh, design. So 4.2 OCS, you need to use uh, EBS for storage layer. We've also used, uh, we've also tested the upcoming new uh, feature in OCS, which makes use of local instance storage. 
just to make sure just to compare how performance looks like and then the third one is uh, uh, using AMQ on top of EVS without using any OCS uh, OCS layer the last one is ephemeral storage which is not which is not something you want to do in production which so I'll just keep it side right now it's for mostly for dev and uh, dev and uh, QA pur testing purpose so as you can see this from 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 red and and, and golden lines uh, OCS on on local storage delivers the best performance uh, across the workloads that we've tested here and uh, OCS when running on um, on EBS imposes some performance stacks the reason is that we are we are running a a distributed storage OCS on top of EBS which is also again another distributed storage so which is why we have to pay a performance tax that you can compare between golden and, and blue so which is why there's a performance tax so so yeah summary is that you know uh, OCS on i3 instances delivers you uh, the best performance that you are looking for same story for uh, the second metric which is the messages consumed per second again OCS on top of i3 instances delivers the best performance uh, one thing we don't have in this graph is we have not tested uh, uh, Kafka on direct i3 instances which Yako mentioned that uh, uh, Kafka usually Kafka people deploy Kafka on physical machines and they just use uh, JBARDs or, or local storage so we have we don't have that metric so we, we accept that uh, the second type of so the, this one was standard performance on a steady state uh, st steady state Kafka cluster. We thought let's introduce let's induce some failure in the Kafka system. So um, we have uh, triggered we have destroyed a pod and tried to inject some some uh, uh, artificial uh, failure scenarios into the situation and try to measure how much does it take for for Kafka running on OCS versus Kafka running on EBS, uh, you know, hit on the recovery. So you can see this, the red line is uh, Kafka on OCS and the blue one is Kafka on EBS. So, uh, so the smaller the, uh, the line, this line is, the better, the better it performs. So you can see this, the red line uh, quickly goes back and, and it, it, the partial recovery is is, uh, is pretty much fast uh, on on OCS bag, bagged Kafka clusters compared to EBS because uh, uh, Kafka has to do you know uh, some regeneration of data because uh, EBS does not provide uh, you know storage level redundancy which Kafka requires or not requires but uh, Kafka would would enjoy if uh, storage by def by default uh, provides that so yeah. OCS helps in faster recovery of the AMQ cluster in case of infra failures like node goes down or storage goes down. We're going to talk about that in a few slides. So this is the additional resiliency part which OCS brings to the table for, for Kafka. Kafka is no doubt inherently resilient, but adding OCS gives it resiliency plus plus. You can think of this. So uh, this is a performance metrics from a different cluster that we have uh, we have tested uh, because we have been getting some questions from the field like uh, I need both performance and resiliency which is multi AZ HA I'm going to talk about this this word in, in the next few slides for Kafka so which storage should I use should I choose OCS or should I use uh, uh, the more expensive storage on on Amazon which is a provision die up so we did a comparison between these two um, more or less these two um, storage classes so the first one is uh, uh, AMQ on OCS and the, the last one is AMQ on EBS provisioned IOPS we found that because eventually uh, at the end both these uh, storage classes are basically using NVMEs underneath but we found that uh, OCS performed slightly better compared to uh, compared to EBS provisioned IOPS which is kind of nice and uh, for both for both messages produced per second as well as messages consumed per second so so yeah if you are if you are an architect if you're designing clusters of Kafka for your customer or even for your companies then probably uh, this makes sense to like uh, OCS on IT instances uh, provides you the the highest performance and 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 the resiliency that you're looking for multi AZ HA and because uh, EBS does not provide multi availability zone uh, high availability kind of okay because it's a, it's a zonal service I'm gonna again I'm gonna talk about this in a few slides but you will understand that 
the second question that we have got from the field is like, hey, I love to run, let's say I love to run AMQ streams on OpenShift container storage, but you have like two storage classes over there. You have block storage, you also have a, a file system storage, CFFS. So which one should I use for, for my Kafka clusters? So Jakub has already pointed out that uh, NFS or read write many volumes are not, I mean, Kafka works on that. You could you could run Kafka clusters using that. But uh, in, in the longer run, there are stability is problem if you're using file systems on top of, uh, uh, underneath Kafka cluster because of the, the you know, the, uh, the locking and all these things which are which are there in, in file system. So so hence, if you are designing this on a Kubernetes native environment, you should be using a block storage provided by by OCS or even in general you should use block storage uh, for for the Kafka needs. And uh, file system causes stability and performance issues. So so yeah. So this is uh, what we have on, on the on the performance side. The second part of the equation is resiliency, like how could OCS helps in improved resiliency for, for Kafka clusters. So for that, we first of all need to understand the problem. What is the resiliency problem do we have? Let's suppose I'm running my, my Kubernetes and Kafka environment on public clouds, because this holds true for most of the public clouds. Every public cloud has their own, own AZ. So, so in this in this diagram we have like we have OpenShift cluster running on uh, let's say running on uh, AWS, and you have uh, you have your open you have your Kafka cluster spread across multiple availability zones. Your Kafka cluster is consuming uh, PVCs, which are being backed by EBS volumes. All good standard architecture. You're using your system. Kafka takes care of the data replication, and uh, but if anything goes down, let's suppose any of the EC2 instance in, in any of your AZ goes down, or let's say your EBS of that AZ goes down, or uh, or the entire availability zone goes down, because it's it's all silicon, it can go wrong, things can go wrong, right? So if a mishap happens in this environment, Kafka, by its nature, given that you have enough nodes in your architecture, it will spawn up Another part because it's all Kubernetes and it will request for a PVC and EBS will give it uh, give it another block storage. However, this this new block storage would be empty because it's a fresh fresh uh, PV which which EBS storage class has given it. So Kafka has to do has to reconstruct all the data in the in the failed EBS volumes and it could take minutes or even days depending on the size of the data that Kafka needs to to, to rebalance. So during this time, you're you are you're staking your your resiliency of the system. So you know, think another mishap on the same same uh, same AZ or a different AZ happens, you are in a problem. You're losing you're losing your uh, availability of the service. So that's a problem. Let's now understand how this problem could be solved using uh, OpenShift container storage. So exact same architecture, but this time we have an OpenShift container storage layer running on top of EBS, which is OpenShift container for, for storage 4.2 uh, thing. You can create uh, an RBD storage class out of EBS storage class, and this time your uh, your storage would be uh, across across availability zones. So again, standard data replication taken care by Kafka, everything is good. And uh, storage level replication is taken by, care by OCS. So all the data is, is, uh, is triple replicated across the availability zones. In this case, let's suppose same thing happens if, if the AZ goes down, EBS goes down, or the entire uh, availability goes down, Kafka will spawn up another pod and uh, it will request for uh, storage. But since it is backed by, now it's backed by OpenShift Container Storage, Open, uh, OCS will give Kafka the same PV or PVC which was originally assigned to your first part and Kafka just need to uh, sync up between the changes. It doesn't need to replicate or, or, or re re regenerate all the failed data because the data is st still there because data was, uh, the replication was taken care by OCS. So this is the ad additional resiliency you can, you can get out of OCS in your clusters it can it can uh, it can handle az failures in case of public clouds
but wait a minute you can you can definitely debate on here like hey okay so we are running so we are uh, going through the performance tax problem which i have explained in my performance test uh, testing we are running a distributed storage on top of a distributed storage so whether i'm going to lose some performance so the answer is yes you want to lose some performance because it's uh, you know it's, it's storage on storage so how can i solve this at the same time having the same resiliency so you can have you can deploy an ocs on top of uh, uh, aws or, or vmware or any public cloud uh, of, you know it inst it type instances which equivalent of uh, azure and google so these local instances provide uh, uh, these physical instances provide uh, uh, nvme volumes exposed to the uh, to the to the to the os and ocs can use local storage operator which is a new feature uh, it's going to come with when uh, in in coming releases in which means there is there is no performance tax layer of ebs so we have completely isolated or removed the the uh, storage layer provided by the public clouds and you can simply have an ocs uh, and simply have kafka requesting storage directly to ocs and if anything goes down and thing goes bad in your in your environment kafka will take care of uh, the data because it doesn't need to regenerate all the data the data is already there and it's fast because it's packed by all uh, flash storage so this is how ocs adds performance and resiliency uh, benefits to uh, to existing resilient architecture of kafka uh, uh real quick going on, going through deployment so it's a standard uh, uh yaml file which you could just use uh, you can go and take a look at streamz.io it has a fantastic documentation yakub and his team is maintaining that it is uh, it will give you enough enough guidance how to deploy your first amq clusters on top of uh, kubernetes or openshift with respect to uh, to storage storage thing you need to make sure that you have a openshift storage cluster on top of it uh, top of your openshift uh, platform and then you just need to add these like four lines in your in the respective sections of kafka and zookeeper so that your kafka and zookeeper clusters can request pvs from from ocs so just six lines of code and you will you'll get additional resiliency and, and performance from the system if you want to go give it a try uh, we uh, you can have this url and uh, uh, which i've created like uh, you can have a step by step instructions to deploy amq streams backed by openshift container storage on top of openshift uh, platform so this guide will will give you step by step instructions how to do that all right so this is all we have today for you guys if you have any question you can ask in here drop in the into the chat uh, we can answer otherwise yeah so back to you Karina. thank you so much pran and Jakob. that was excellent thank you everybody for joining us today for all things data and our special guests Jakob schultz and pran singh from red hat and join us next time again same time next tuesday at 8 a.m. Pacific, 9 a.m. Mountain, and we will all see you soon. Thank you again for joining us.